Okay, think about this for a moment. Imagine looking up, maybe not literally, but looking at the data and realizing an object sailing through our solar system right now wasn't born here. Yeah. Didn't form with our sun, our planets. It's, well, it's genuinely alien. A traveler from another star system, light years away, carrying who knows what kind of dust and ice. And that's not science fiction anymore, is it? No, not at all. It's a reality we've actually seen happen three times now. So today we're doing a deep dive into the third known interstellar visitor. Its designation is 3i plus. Our mission here is to really unpack the key facts, its path, what it actually is, and crucially, what it means for science. Right. Because the latest on 3i Eichlis suggests something pretty exciting. Yeah. We might not just be watching the next one fly by, we might actually be planning a mission to go meet it. And that potential shift, you know, from just passively observing these things yeah. to actively thinking about engineering missions, that's exactly why this deep dive feels so relevant right now. For, well, for centuries, the idea of something from another star just passing through was purely theoretical, mm -hmm. maybe a bit romantic even. Sure. Then, bam, in just the last, what, seven years, we've gone from zero confirmed sightings to three. We're literally watching astronomical history unfold. Oh. And the amount of knowledge we're gaining, it's building up incredibly fast. Yeah. Almost exponentially. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. Give it some context. Because, you know, three might sound small, mm -hmm. but for something this incredibly rare, it feels well, like <laughs> monumental. So why exactly is 3i8 less, this third one, such a big deal? It's a big deal partly because it completes a kind of initial set, a trio. Mm -hmm. And having three gives us vital data for comparison. You really need to remember the first two to grasp why ATL is so significant. Right. The first one, everyone remembers Oumuamua, observed back in 2017. Oh, yeah, the weird one. Exactly. That object just broke the mold. It was uh, cigar-shaped, really elongated. And the weirdest part, its movement. Mm -hmm. It showed non-gravitational acceleration. Meaning it sped up more than just the sun's gravity could account for. Precisely. It got an extra push from something. And that's the crucial detail, isn't it? That non-gravitational bit. That's what fueled all that speculation, famous, maybe infamous about it possibly being, you know, a derelict alien artifact mm -hmm. or some kind of technology. Because scientists couldn't definitively say what was causing that extra boost. Exactly right. It didn't look like anything we'd seen before, and it certainly didn't act like anything we'd seen before. <laughs> it was genuinely mysterious. Still is, to some extent. Okay. Then, just two years later, in 2019, along came Tree Borisov. Right, the second visitor. And Borisov, thankfully for planetary scientists maybe, behaved much more conventionally. Oh, okay. Less weird. Much less weird. It was clearly a comet. It developed this huge tail, a coma. Mm -hmm. That confirmed it was made of ices and other volatile stuff sublimating off. So it looked like a comet we might see from our own Oort cloud, just right. from somewhere else. Pretty much, yeah. It gave us our first clear look, really, at the icy building blocks that get ejected from some other star's planetary nursery. Okay, so we had Umamua, the mystery object, and Borisov, the interstellar comet. Now we have three I Atlas. So which way does this one lean? Towards the mystery or the more conventional? Well, initially, when it was first spotted, it was kind of a blank slate. But just the fact that we could spot it and track it, along with the others, in such a short span of time, that tells us something important. What's that? It tells us our survey technology, like the ATLA's telescope system it's named after, is getting incredibly good. We're not just relying on sheer luck anymore. Right. We actually have systems designed to find these things now. Yes. We've built up a capability to catch these galactic migrants as they swing by. And the rate of discovery itself suggests, you know, we should probably expect more of them, which for astronomers is fantastic news. A dream come true, really. It really does feel like we've just cracked up in a new window on the universe. <laughs> okay, let's shift gears and talk about 3i Atlas's journey, its path through our solar system. Now, for anyone hearing interstellar visitor and getting maybe a little anxious. Yeah, understandable. You can probably relax. It kept a very respectable distance. Definitely. The simulations show its path weaving through the inner solar system relative to the orbits of, let's see, Mars, Venus, Earth, Mercury, even Jupiter played a role gravitationally. So it definitely came through the warmer zone. It did pass through the inner regions, yes. But crucially, 3 ILSs was strictly a flyby. 
Its trajectory confirms it never got closer than about 1.8 astronomical units, or AU, to Earth. Okay, 1.8 AU. Remind us how far that is. That's about 1.8 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, so roughly 170 million miles, give or take. That's uh, Yeah, that's a comfortable distance. No close calls there. Not at all. Yeah. A very safe gap for us observers down here. But, and this is where it gets really interesting, that distance combined with its speed turns out to be potentially game-changing. How? Well, remember, Umumua. It was moving incredibly fast relative to us. So fast that any idea of sending a probe to catch up to it was basically impossible with current tech. Right, it was just screaming past. Exactly. But 3IA class came in with a much lower relative velocity. Slower. Okay. So the fact it was far away is good news for safety, but the fact that speed was lower is even better news for maybe visiting it. Is that what you're getting at? Precisely. This is where the engineers start getting really interested. See, to intercept anything in space, you need to figure out the change in velocity your spacecraft needs. That's called delta V, the delta V. Okay. For Oumuamua, the delta V required to match its speed was just enormous, way beyond what our current rockets can manage in a reasonable time frame. It would take it maybe decades to build up that kind of speed. But 3 ITL as being slower, that lowers the bar. Dramatically. It drops the technical hurdle quite significantly. And recent analyses coming out of NASA and related groups have actually stated this publicly. Stated what? That missions to study an object like 3IA tests, maybe not this specific one since it's already hitting out again, but the next one that comes through with similar dynamics are now considered feasible and affordable. Feasible and affordable. Wow, that feels like a massive shift. It is. It moves the whole concept from the realm of like science fiction or maybe far future tech right into the realm of practical mission planning. Okay. It means we could, theoretically, launch a relatively small, maybe specialized probe using an existing rocket system, chase down the fourth or fifth visitor, and study it up close. Maybe even fly through its scale if it has one, or capture tiny dust particles. That is genuinely mind-blowing. A mission to study actual material from another star system. If we could pull that off, capture data, or even samples from, say, the fourth visitor, what kind of science are we talking about? The payoff must be huge. Oh, immense. We'd be looking at potential answers to some really fundamental questions. Yeah. Right now, almost everything we know about how planets form is based on our solar system's chemistry. Right, our local neighborhood. Exactly. By analyzing material ices, dust, gas from a completely different star system, we can answer things like, are the basic building blocks the same everywhere? Is the ratio of, say, carbon monoxide ice to water ice different in other systems? Do they carry different amounts of complex organic molecules? Wow. So it's like getting a sample from a completely different chemical experiment happening light years away, unlocking a piece of the universal recipe book. That's a great way to put it. Exactly. Okay, let's move into our third section here and tackle something that always seems to pop up with these visitors. The speculation. Ever since Uamua, that idea of alien artifacts always seems to be lurking in the background. Did 3 Atlas spark similar talk before we got a good look at it? Oh, definitely. Especially in the you know broader public discussion. Anytime an object shows up and its origin is literally interstellar, completely foreign, that speculation about non-natural origins is almost inevitable. Especially after Umumu, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Umumu's weird behavior really primed people for that possibility. But uh, luckily, perhaps for clarity, in the case of 3 Atlas, recent observations provided some pretty crucial evidence that has, well largely clarified its nature. It's helped tamp down that technological speculation quite a bit. Okay, so what was the key piece of evidence? The smoking gun, so to speak. It grew a tail. Ah, like Borisov. Exactly. As 3i Atlas got closer to the sun and heated up, it started actively shedding material. Observers detected a visible coma, that fuzzy atmosphere around the nucleus, and then a distinct tail streaming away. And that observation confirms. Like it confirms pretty much beyond reasonable doubt, it's cometary nature. It's behaving like a comet. Okay, but hang on. If it just has a tail like a regular comet, doesn't that make it, well, maybe a bit boring? We've got loads of comets from our own solar system. Why is an interstellar comet more valuable scientifically than one of ours? That's a fantastic question. And the answer really comes down to its origin, its composition. Our local comets, the ones from the Oort cloud or Kuiper belt, they tell us about the chemistry of our original solar nebula, the disk our sun formed from. Right. Our own history. Yes. But an interstellar comet, like 3 I Edley's, or like Borisov before it, tells us about the chemistry of a different stellar nursery, the one it got kicked out of billions of years ago, light years away. I see. So when we see that tail, 
we know it's made mostly of ices and volatiles that are sublimating, turning straight from solid ice into gas because of the sun's heat. And scientists can analyze the light coming from that gas. Using spectroscopy. Exactly. That spectrum acts like a unique chemical fingerprint. It tells us what gases are in the tailwater vapor, right. carbon monoxide, ammonia, maybe other things. So by reading the barcode in the tail's light, we're basically getting a chemical analysis of an environment around a totally different unknown star. That's precisely it. The data strongly points to three ayatlets being a natural object, specifically a very rich, confirmed interstellar comet. And that's incredibly valuable. For instance, if we measured the ratios of different ices, say methane compared to water ice, and find it's really different from our own comets, uh -huh. that suggests its home system had a, a different temperature history, a different chemical environment when its planets were forming. This kind of data is gold dust for refining our models of how planets form, not just here, but across the entire galaxy. This has been really fascinating. A great look at our third confirmed interstellar guess. Okay, let's try to crystallize this. What are the two, maybe three most critical takeaways we should lock in about 3 ILS? Hmm. Okay, two big ones, I think. Go for it. First, 3 ILS is confirmed as a rare natural interstellar comet. Seeing the tail was key. It's providing real specific chemical clues about the material ejected from other star systems. It reinforces the idea that the galaxy is actively mixing up its planetary ingredients. Okay, takeaway one, it's a natural comet from afar giving us chemical clues. What's number two? Number two is maybe even more forward-looking. Thanks to its, let's say, advantageous speed and trajectory slower than Oumuamua, the analysis of three Ialis has fundamentally shifted the conversation about deep space missions. Right, the feasible and affordable part. Exactly. Its parameters showed us that intercepting the next visitor like it isn't sci-fi anymore, it's achievable. Which means the scientific payoff from the fourth or fifth visitor could be absolutely enormous. We might not just watch it fly by, we might actually, you know, touch it, chemically speaking. Taste it almost, wow. Yeah. And connecting that to the bigger picture, the real value here is just how quickly we're gaining knowledge from these incredibly unusual sources. Okay. Think about it. Seven years, three unique visitors, we had the weird accelerator Umumua, the classic comet Borisov, mm. and now ATLS confirming icy bodies are definitely cruising the galaxy. It's an amazing rate of progress. It really is. And that leads to a final thought, maybe something for you, the listener, to ponder after this deep dive. Considering this rapid discovery rate and the fact that two out of the three were confirmed comets, mm. what does that imply about the sheer density of this kind of icy, volatile material just floating around in interstellar space? How much of this stuff is out there? Mm, good question. And if we can now feasibly plan missions to intercept the next one, what secrets might that fourth interstellar traveler unlock? Maybe clues about the origins of complex organic molecules or something entirely unexpected.